So, of course, Matthew chapter 14, you've got a lot of great miracles here. You've got, uh, you know, Jesus feeding the thousands with a few loaves. And, of course, that very well-known story where Peter walks out on the water and, you know, begins to doubt and then sinks. Uh, but then there at the end, you also see this other kind of, this other miracle that kind of gets looked over because of the fact that it, it's kind of overshadowed by these other ones. But it says there in those last couple of verses, it says in verse 35, and the men of that place had knowledge of him. They sent unto all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. So Jesus comes over into this land and they hear that he's there. So they begin to send out word that, hey, Jesus is here. And they sent out unto everybody around the country and they bring everybody that's diseased. You know, they're just everyone in that area that has something wrong with them. They're bringing him to Jesus. And it says in verse 36 and, thir 36, and besought him that, he might only t that they might only touch the hem of, the gar of his garment. And as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. So it's an amazing miracle, again, that just kind of gets overshadowed by the fact that there's all these other great miracles in this chapter. But all these people are coming to Jesus and they're, they're beseeching him, they're begging him that if they could just get close enough to Jesus to just touch even his garment, not have him look at them or him speak to them or do some miracle like we see in other passages where he's healing the blind men through you know spitting on their eyes and making clay and and saying certain things to people raising the the dead by you know telling them speaking words unto them he's just passing by and these people are just reaching out and just touching his garment and they're healed they're made perfectly whole and that's the title of the sermon tonight made perfectly whole and i want to kind of just use that phrase and, and apply it to ourselves tonight that we as christians need to become perfectly whole now, let me just start out by defining perfect. Of course, perfect, where I'm not talking about becoming sinless, that we're going to reach, you know, like we often use the word perfect today in our modern English. We would say, you know, that's perfect. Like there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's, it's perfect. But it, in biblically, what it's saying is that when they're made perfectly whole, it's kind of in that phrase right there, perfectly whole. To be perfect in the scriptures is to be made whole, to be complete. If you would, go over to James chapter 1. This is a great way to define what the Bible means by perfect or perfectly. Not sinless, but complete. You're going to James 1, and I should have had you keep something in Matthew 14, so you might want to keep something there. But I found another passage I thought that helps define uh, this word perfect. In Deuteronomy 25, it says, Thou shalt have a perfect and a just weight, a perfect and a just measure th shalt thou have that they day, days may be lengthened the land which the Lord thy, giveth, Lord thy God giveth thee. So he's saying, look, your weights, your measurements, they have to be perfect, meaning what? That they're not going to say, you know, this is one pound, but it's actually, you know, 0.8 pounds. They're going to be perfect. They're going to be complete. They're going to be whole. They're going to have all the weight that they are supposed to have. If you look there in James 1, it says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work. You know, let her work on you. Let it run its course. Why? That ye may be perfect and entire. So you can again see how the Bible uses the word perfect by being complete, by being entire, by not wanting, by wanting nothing, he's saying there. Not being lacking, but being perfect. He goes on and says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and, he, and it shall be given him. So again, the Bible use of the word perfect means to be complete or to be made perfect. Uh, to, to not lack anything. And that's kind of when I want to apply this, uh, this phrase here, being made perfectly whole. That's how I want to use this tonight to emphasize the fact that we as Christians, we have to be perfectly whole as Christians. We can't be lacking things in our Christian life. And now, of course, here in the context of Matthew chapter 14, the primary application often is that of salvation. You know, one is, you know, it goes to show you that one touch is all that's needed. That if a person just touches Jesus... Just one time, they're complete. You know, that salvation's a one-time thing. That you only need to be born again once. You don't have to be born again and again and again. That once you're born again, you're born again. That's it. Once you touch the hem of that garment for salvation, you're whole. You're complete. You're, it's, and not only that, but that it's enough for everyone. I'm going to have you go over to Mark chapter 5. You know, there's salvations for everybody. You know, it's, it's only a one-time thing. The Bible says in, in Luke 6, He came down with them and stood in the plain, this course, after He calls the disciples, and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of the people of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, came, which came to hear him, to be healed of their diseases. And they were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. The other thing I want you to notice is that it says that when these people touched him, the virtue went out from him and healed them. 
Again, it's a great picture of salvation showing us that it's the Lord that heals us, that He's the one that makes us whole. Yeah. You know, we reach out, we touch in faith, trusting that, this is, that, that Jesus is going to make us whole when it comes to salvation. But it's His virtue that comes out of Him and makes us whole. It's not our own good works. It's not our own good deeds. So, of course, that's the primary application here that I believe that we could use. <coughs> that it's His virtue and not ours that heals. Look there in Mark chapter 5, in verse 27, it says, When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind Him. Of course, this is the woman that was uh, you know, vexed with the issue of blood for 12 years. And she says that he came, she came in the press behind Him and touched His garment. For she said, If I may but touch His clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, why has, why, Who touched my clothes? So again, it's his virtue that heals. It's his goodness. It's his grace that makes us whole when it comes to salvation. But we all understand that. So tonight I want to use this as more of a secondary application and the fact that we need to draw near to Christ to be made whole as believers. That we need to get close enough to God to where we are, you know, in a spiritual sense, touching Him. That we are, we're at, at arm's length with the Lord in order to be made what? To be made perfectly whole as Christians. As you read in James, you know, that if let patience ever work, that you what? May be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If you lack wisdom, let Him ask of God. You know, that we should not be lacking things in our Christian life. We should always be. Uh, trying to add to our faith and, and growing. If you would, go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. The Christian, though they are saved, is not immediately perfectly whole. We know that when He comes and when He shall appear, we shall be as He is, that we will have the mind of Christ, the, a, a glorified body that will be delivered from the old man once and for all and that we will be whole in that moment but until then we still have the sin nature with us we still have the spirit and the flesh conflicting with one or one another every day and if we so we as christians need to be made perfectly whole we need to strive to become better christians every single day we must add to our faith as it says here in second peter chapter one look at verse one it says simon peter a servant and apostle of jesus christ to them that have obtained like precious faith. They've already obtained it. You know, they've already gotten saved. With us through the righteousness of God and, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5. And besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith. And of course, we've read this list before. I've heard it preached. All these, these virtues and the knowledge and the temperance and the patience. All these things that we are to add to our faith. And if we're lacking these things, then we are not whole as Christians. We are not made perfectly whole. If we desire to be fruitful, all these things must be added. You know, and this is just one list in the scriptures. There's many other things that we ought to be endeavoring as Christians to add to our life to be made perfectly whole. And it says there in verse 5, besides all this, giving all diligence. In order to be made perfectly whole as a Christian, you're going, it's going to take diligence. It's not something that's just going to happen by itself. You're not just going to put your, pill, your, your, your Bible under your pillow at night and sleep on it and by osmosis wake up, you know, just a spirit-filled believer that's on fire for God and, and living, you know, uh, you know, godly in Christ Jesus. It's not going to happen. You have to determine to live that life and you, it's going to take diligence in order to be made perfectly whole as a, Christian, as a Christian. This process of being made perfectly whole requires effort on our part. <coughs> You know, many people, they desire to be closer to God. They would say they want that, but few of them have the faith to actually make that happen. A few of them want to put forth that effort to make that happen. If you're there in Matthew 14, in verse 22, we'll look at that, of course, famous miracle of Peter walking on the, on the water. It says in verse 22, Matthew 14, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side. And while he sent the multitudes away, and when they had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be, if it be thou, bid me to come unto the, unto the end of the water. And I just, you know, we kind of, pick on Peter sometimes, but man, the, the, 
for all the faults that he may, might have had, the, the, you know, that makes him relatable. We also look at this and say, well, I wonder how he re relatable he is to us in this passage. Right. Will we be like Peter? Would we be one of the guys back in the boat? Saying, Peter, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you can't walk on the water, Peter. I mean, he's, the Lord's coming. He'll get close enough to us. And the, you know, the Lord's going to come to us. He'll climb up in the boat. We'll, all, we'll be close to God together. Don't be such a showboat, Peter. Don't be, you know, you're just trying to show off. No, Peter really wanted to be with the Lord. He really wanted to get closer to God in that moment. He really wanted to know what it was to walk by faith with the Lord. And that required, you know, him stepping out of that boat, you know, when everybody else was just going to stay back in the boat where it was safe and where they had sure footing. But he was the one that decided to step out and to come onto him on the water. <coughs> You know, many people would like to do things like this. They would love to do these great works for God. They would love to do the works like, like Paul did. You know, know the great victories like, like, uh, like Peter here. They would love to do all these great things, but few are willing to, be, to, to suffer like he did. I mean, Peter was in the midst of a storm when he did this. I mean, they're, they're thinking they're going to die. And he's walking on the water. It wasn't a nice, bright, sunshiny day. The waters are just smooth as glass when he's doing this great miracle. So in order to get close to God, we have to put ourselves in that position where we have to step out by faith and be uncomfortable. And you have to be willing to go through these storms. You know, and like, like, uh, like Paul. You know, Paul did great works for God, but you want to talk about a guy that suffered for the Lord's sake. I mean, that guy suffered. He said in Philippians, and if you would, go over to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3. He said in Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I mean, he's, he's, he's ready to just die. He counts his life as nothing. He had, a, he had a desire to depart and to be with the Lord, which is far better. Nevertheless, he chose to abide in the flesh because it was needful for those around him. It says there in Philippians 3, we'll look at verse 7. He says, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith. So you see, Paul here, he's the type of person that, you know, he did all these great works, but at what price? What was the mentality that he had? A willingness just to count it all dung, just to count it all as worthless. So this process of being made perfectly whole, of drawing closer to God and Him molding us into what we need to be as Christians requires effort. It requires sacrifice. And the fact is that many people, though they would like that, are not willing to make that effort. They won't do it. Look at uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And it won't be a long uh, sermon tonight, but I think it's an important one. It's an important concept. It's something that we have to understand as Christians that if we want to be made perfectly whole and not just live a mediocre Christian life, mm. not just live this, this ho-hum Christian life where we really don't get anything done for God, you know, we're going to have to understand that we need to be made whole. And in order to do that, you have to put forth the effort. You're going to have to be diligent to add to your faith. Mm. You've got to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable circumstances. Right. And we love the idea of walking by faith, but... You know, it's easy to walk by faith when everything's going right. It's easy to walk by faith when life is just all lined up and everything, the job's going great, the finances are great, the home life is great, and, and the, everything's going great in the world. But it's when things get tough, when things get hard, that's when we really learn to walk by faith. When we're uncertain, when, we're, when we really tru ha truly just have to trust God for what's going to happen next. <clears throat> and that's what Peter did. He didn't know. He, he had the faith to say, I'm going to step on this water and it's going to hold me and I'm going to walk to the Lord and draw closer. But, you know, a lot of people might in that boat might have been saying, you're crazy. What are you doing? Look what's going on around you. And the fact is, many will not make the effort necessary to draw closer to God to be made perfectly whole as Christians. Look at Luke chapter 17, verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when they saw him, he said to them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. You, know, you can look at every single one of these miracles and just see 
how they had to have faith in order to be healed, in order to be cleansed. They had to believe what he said, his word, right. and, and it wasn't until they stood up and had to act in that faith that they were cleansed. <coughs> it says in verse 15, <coughs> And one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. So he heals these ten people, these ten lepers, and one of them glorifies God. And he's, he looks down, he's healed of his disease, and he lifts up his voice and glorifies God and felt, and, he, and it says that he fell down at, on his face at his feet. So instead of going to the priest like he was told, he just forgets all that, runs away from the other nine guys who just go on their merry way and runs towards the Lord and falls on his face and glorifies God. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They are not found to return to give glory to God save the stranger. Because you have to remember they were in Samaria. So this is a stranger. He's not even a Jew. And he said unto them, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. You know, the other nine, they didn't want to make the effort. Oh, Jesus, he's all the way over there. And I'm already cleansed. I'm already healed. I mean, I appreciate what the Lord's done for me, but I'm just going to go on my own way. Right. And the, the one guy, the few, the one out of the ten was the one that decided, you know what, I'm going to glorify God and turned around and put forth the effort to draw near to God and fall on his face and glorify him. Not everyone's willing to do that. And in order to draw near, you have to, you say, well, I want to be like that one. But in order to do that, you have to let nothing get in your way. Nothing distracts you. If you have the attitude like Paul, it's all dung. Compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. All of it is worthless. Go over to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 and verse 22, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell down at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of the physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind him. So you have to get the idea here that all these people are just thronging Jesus. I mean, they're just pressing on him. It's like trying to get through this thick crowd of people. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, but it, and it's not always easy. You've ever been on a crowded street or something like that where you have to navigate around people or just a very tightly packed group of people. If you want to get through, you just have to start grabbing shoulders and jackets and throwing elbows and, and trying to get in there. And that's what she did. It says she came in the press behind him and she went through everybody. She wasn't letting anybody get in her way. She was going to get close to God. She didn't care how many other rulers were there, how many other more important people than her were there. She was going to draw close to God that day and nobody was going to stop her because she knew that Jesus had what she needed. And nothing was going to stop her. And I wonder if we had that would have that same attitude. Because though we're healed, though we're already saved, there's many things that we still require from God as Christians. Yeah. We still need the wisdom and the knowledge and the virtue and the patience and all of these things. But are we willing to press through all the things that get in our way? Or are we just going to say, it's too crowded. Life's too busy. I don't have time to get close to God. There's more important things. My, the, the, I guess the things that I need aren't really that important. Or is it just because they're not, it's just not convenient? And he said, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was drawn up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And what I love about this is that, you know, God notices when we get close. Look at verse 30. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And of course, his disciples here, perplexed by this question, saying, Thou seest the multitudes, sayest thou who touched me? But he knew that there was one person there that had made the effort, that had pressed through all those people because she desired something from him and she got it. And he already knew who it was, you know, but the God notices when we take the time and put in the effort and remain diligent to develop as Christians, to grow, to be made perfectly whole, he takes notice of that. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Amen. That's a promise that we have from God. We say, God feels so far away from me. It just seems like it's just this, you know, he's just a, you know, a concept to me. He's not a person. He's not real to me. Well, are you trying to get closer to him? 
Are you doing your part to draw closer to him? Because if you will press toward him, he'll, he'll notice and he'll draw nigh to you. So the, really what I'm trying to, uh, how can we apply this tonight practically as Christians? You know, you say this all sounds great, but what, it, what specifically should I do tonight? You know, I want peace. I want to be whole. I want to grow as a Christian. I want to, uh, you know, grow and add these things to my faith. And draw nigh to God. Well, you don't have to put forth the effort. You have to draw close. And to just give you a practical application tonight, how about reading your Bible? That's probably the one thing that will draw you closer to God than anybody. It's probably the most neglected thing amongst Christians is the reading of the Scriptures. The, just the daily getting in there and reading your Bible. I mean, if we would read this book, I mean, we, we have God in our hands. Not the, not the paper and the ink, but the words of God are right here. He's at arm's length. The Bible says in, in Psalm 119, I rejoice at that word as one that findeth great spoil. You know, spoil, not you know, stuff that's gone bad in the fridge, but spoil like when you, the spoils of war. One that comes upon treasure suddenly and it all comes into a great wealth. That's what he, the, the psalmist is saying. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. There's just this treasure trove of just wisdom and knowledge and all these things that are going to help us draw closer to God right at our fingertips. But we just take it for granted. We say, well, it's not, to us, it's not spoil. You know, to us, it might as well be spoils of in a fridge. Something that we just say, eh, I'll get around to it. I can't. I'll clean that up later. You know, it's not a treasure to us. He said, I hate, a I hate a boring and lying, but thy law do I love. Can we say that tonight? Can we say that we love God's word? That it's a treasure to us? That we look forward to getting up early and getting in it and spending time in it? Do you ever get to the end of your day asking your, wait, and saying, I can't wait to get back in my Bible? If not, you, know, you, need to do, you need to check your heart. Because this is how you're going to draw nigh to God. Jesus isn't going to walk in the room today. You know, he's not going to have, there's not going to be a physical garment that you can go lay hands on today and take in your hands and hold and feel. But you can wrap your hands around this book. You could reach out and grab this and feel this in your hand and this will bring you closer to God today. Read your Bible. <laughs> he said, Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Wouldn't it be great to have peace today? I mean, there's so much uncertainty, especially these days, about what's going on in the world around us. And people, so many people don't have peace. They're just, they're fretting. They're biting their nails. They're worried. They need to get in this book and love this book and walk by faith according to this book. And if they do that, they'll have peace. It's guaranteed. Great peace have they which love thy law. People that love it, that want to be in it. You know, we were here at the potluck yesterday. I broke out that fancy Bible of mine, right? <laughs> With that soft goatskin leather, right? That premium, and it's, and I like it. It's butter. I'm going to break on it. I spent good money on that Bible. Buttery smooth. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I bought it myself. <laughs> right? It's a nice Bible. But I don't care what was around that Bible. I don't care if it was wrapped in sandpaper. It's the words that are in here that matter. And we, if we would read the scriptures, if we would just reach out, and no matter what, what was the, the binding was, whatever it was, it was just some paperback off the back shelf over there, and we would just put our hands on this book, you know what you're doing? You're touching the border of his garment today. You're touching, you're reaching out and grabbing a hold of God today when you pick up your Bible. <clears throat> and when we read it, and with those that love it and spend time of it, and anyone who's done it knows I'm telling the truth, that when you read that book, you could begin to feel his presence. He begins to speak to you through that. Some passage just smites your heart or brings you joy or brings you happiness or convicts you or something. It moves in your life. It works in your heart. brings a tear to the eye. It, does, it has power in it. Why is that? Because you're touching God. You're reaching out and you're grabbing a hold of the Lord. It molds us into what we ought to be as Christians. It makes us perfectly whole. How are you going to be made perfectly whole tonight? By reading this book right here. Amen. Not just by wanting to, not just by wishing it into existence. You're going to have to get in this book, reach out, grab a hold of it, go through the press of, of your busy schedule. Push through the press of everything that's trying to distract you from stopping 
and cracking open this book and reach out and grab the border of his garment in the Bible. <coughs> and that's going to mold us in we, uh, what we are going to be. You know, every day, the Lord's just passing by at arm's length of so many Christians. Every day, he's just right there on the coffee table, just passing us by. Every day, he's just on our nightstand, just right there, just passing us by. But so few of us actually reach out and grab a hold and say, I want to draw closer to God and open it up and get in it. So that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do tonight, to be made perfectly whole through reading your Bible. Don't let the Lord just pass you by. Reach out tonight and grab a hold of it and be made perfectly whole. Let's go ahead and pray.